Um, I will admit that I'm going to be taking us slightly off of the circularity of the conversations we've been having um, and talk about the human side of um, the fashion industry and specifically the, the issues that I know about. So, thank you over to you. Um, a lot of people I've found in this space tend to talk about these three um, topics. People, planet, profit. I hear this a lot and people, peace has always been um, I, you know, know there's a ton of issues in this space that we all are pretty familiar, I'm sure, but um, some of the things that have caught me over the years are that this industry is huge. I did a study from 2016 found that one in six people work in the global um, apparel industry, and, and this spans from the farmers growing cotton, make a shirt, all the way to the um, skilled tailors stitching, Products. And we, we see a lot of danger in this field for people, right? Um, you know, I think we all remember Rana Plaza, over a thousand people killed five years ago. Um, we've seen horrible respiratory diseases, cancer, skin diseases, kind of leather tanneries and um, garment factories. And so over the years, as I you know, learned more about this is these issues, um, I found a lot of them pulled on me, but two things in particular have always been um, my passions, and that's child labor and forced labor within this industry. Um, a quick overview of the issues. There are over 152 million children laboring in the world today. Um, I'm not talking about having a job at a coffee shop or a mall after school. Child labor is defined by the ILO as work that is mentally, physically, socially, or morally dangerous and harmful to children and that interferes with their schooling. Um, you see there's also a huge number there, 73 million in hazardous forms of child labor. Um, the difference between regular child labor and hazardous is hazardous child labor puts children at risk of being killed, injured, or made ill as a consequence of poor safety and health standards. We see this in a variety of places in the fashion industry. Um, some examples could be you know, working around dangerous toxins near a tannery or in a um, factory that uses chemical dyes, things like that. Um, the other side here, forced labor is a form of modern slavery. Uh, it's any work or service that's extracted from a person under the threat of penalty of, um, uh, under the threat of penalty through force, fraud, or coercion. Those three words being key. Um, and for us, in the uh, looking at the apparel industry, the big pieces that, the big numbers that we focus on here are the 16 million people who would be in forced labor in the private economy, and more than 4 million people in forced labor under state-imposed situations. So examples being debt bondage in a factory in Vietnam, or um, the, the state-sponsored system of forced labor we see in the Uzbekistan cotton industry. Um, okay, so you may wonder why these issues persist. And it's something I ask all the time. There are a whole host of reasons why these things continue to exist in this world. Um, list them all, go all the way down to the mortality of humans, but um, I do want to stress today the, the unique way in which ways in which the apparel supply chain is particularly well suited for exploitation like this. Um, in this era of fast fashion, apparel supply chains are increasingly com complicated. Even the most well-intentioned brands often don't know what's happening below their first tier suppliers. So they'll conduct spot checks on the first tier, the, the supplier that's sending them products, but often they're not doing any kind of auditing below that. We see a lot of outsourcing to other smaller factories, to home-based work, um, and that's where we find all these issues. Um, child labor and forced labor happen at the bottom of the supply chain usually. Many companies lack this visibility, and so they either knowingly or unknowingly end up with exploitation in their supply chains. Um, one thing I uh, want to note is that slavery, including um, forced labor and um, 
subtracting all these different things that fall under the umbrella is not legal anywhere, but it happens everywhere. So I'm going to give an example of something that I've seen and worked on, and it just happens to be from India, but I, this is not to say that this is an India problem or a regional problem, this happens everywhere. Um, who here has heard of the Suman Valley scheme? Anyone? Okay, a couple hands. A couple hands, yeah. Um, so I'm going to give a very condensed version of what this is. Uh, put very simply, Suman Valley means happily married woman in Tamil. Um, and we see this scheme, we've been seeing it for years, where uh, labor recruiters, like brokers, from southern India, working where most of the apparel manufacturing is happening, go to northern India and find uh, poor young women. And when I say young women, I mean girls. They're 14 to 18 usually. And they offer them this proposition of come work for our factory for two to five years. Uh, at the end, you will receive a lump sum and you can use that for your dowry. And that will ensure that you become a happily married woman. And you're from a poor family, you're not going to be able to afford a dowry, so this solves your problem. <coughs> um, this scheme is problematic for a number of reasons that I don't need to list them all. You know, it's, it's not um, okay for someone to be offering a lump sum to another person at the end of five years. It's not okay to pull a young girl out of school and take her states away. Uh, we see a lot of sexual exploitation happen, or even just you know, general mistreatment, health issues. Um, but we also see it quite often, these lump sums are never paid. And so we both work for years and get nothing in return. Um, this scheme is something that is very prevalent, and we, I mean, yeah, we see a lot. So, part of why I love my current job is that I get to work on stuff like this all the time, every day. Um, Good Weave, the organization I worked for after about 20 years in the drug and carpet industry in most of Southeast Asia, uh, decided to expand in 2016 and replicate our programs into new industries, including apparel. And our system has four key components to it listed here that um, we think are a proven approach to solving these issues, solving problems just like the Sumang Valley scheme or others that we see within apparel, and tea, bricks, um, home textiles, and fashion jewelry. The first half um, of that list that I just had is really what I spend most of my time on. Harnessing market power and establishing clean supply chains. Um, this includes building up consumer demand for ethically made products. Um, also working directly with businesses to ensure that their supply chains actually are clean, mapping all the way down to the home-based work. And then, you know, addressing child labor, addressing forced labor instances when they find them and remediating those situations. After identifying issues through audits, uh, our teams on the ground in India, Nepal, wherever, um, go in and clean up the supply chains. They don't just say, here's your problem, here's your report, go fix it. We offer a solution. And then we continue to check out with these companies doing random audits, random inspections over the course of years, and over time we found that it really increases transparency and accountability, and um, helps the companies produce a better product at the end of the day, because they can be proud of the things that they're selling. We also implement um, social programs, and these social programs create educational opportunities for the children, the communities surrounding the factories or, or uh, home-based work that we are um, you know, working on. These programs have two purposes, mainly. So remediating former child workers, we don't use the word rescue, um, and then also prevention so that other children are not ending up in these situations. And lastly, we also work with adults who are in the factories or doing home-based work. And I think this is really key because we don't just want to say child labor is done, forced labor is done, but we don't care about your other issues. We really want to create supply chains and systems that are ethical all the way down so if we can work with the employees to ensure that other forms of exploitation are not happening as well, then we've done our job. Okay, enough about my job. I think it's always important in these conversations to talk about what we as just people can do. It's something I've always liked when I go to conferences. I want to leave with some action items. Um, so, I have a few suggestions. I think the first thing we have to do is we have to educate 
Conference, which I feel like we're all down for since we're here. And I think some resources I might recommend are, of course, my own organization because I have to plug it, but also like Fashion Revolution is great. There's some really wonderful documentaries out there, The True Cost, um, this one, Price of Free, is actually about our founder. Um, Safi Mani's book, Slave to Fashion, is a really great book that kind of gives you a good overview and starting point if you're interested in slavery in the fashion industry. My favorite part about this book is she has a ton of resources listed at the back, so you can do a bunch more reading and more documentary watching after the fact. I think the, the next step then, though, is after we've educated ourselves, we have to take action. Um, all these resources have a how to get involved section somewhere. So you can support organizations doing the work. Um, we accept donations. You can join campaigns uh, when they're happening. You, that helps you know, drive the market as a consumer. As my friend Rebecca Ballard says, uh, vote with your wallet. I think that's powerful. There are tons of great resources to help you do this. Done good, uh, good on you, or some apps that I love that help me shop ethically. But then there's also the option to just look for a label when you're out and about. And with that, I'm going to stop. And if there's any questions, I'll say answer. Yeah. 